Well, good morning and welcome to the Men's Leadership Network. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to all the satellite campuses, viewing at Bricks and Cool Springs and at Flavor Catering downtown Nashville. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we'll, we'll go for about 25 minutes and we'll have time for questions. So if you have any questions and you want to tweet them in, the Twitter handle is at leadership underscore net or the email is questions at mensleadershipnetwork.com. This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Charles Overby. Uh, we're going to talk politics for the next little bit and then, and then take some time for questions. Mr. Overby is the chairman of the Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics at the University of Mississippi. He has served as the chair and CEO of the Freedom Forum, a nonpartisan foundation that educates people about the First Amendment, the Newseum, which we have a nice image behind us if you have a second to check that out, the Newseum, which is considered one of the most interactive museums in the world, and the Diversity Institute, a school that teaches journalists and aspiring journalists with the goal of increasing diversity in the newsrooms. Throughout his career, Mr. Overby has traveled to six continents, speaking about media issues and promoting First Amendment freedoms. Before joining the Freedom Forum, he was a reporter and editor for 16 years, covering Congress, the U.S. Supreme Court, the White House, and presidential campaigns for Gannett Company, the nation's largest newspaper company. Overby was the executive editor of the Clarion Ledger in Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, in 1983, when it won the Pulitzer Prize Award for Public Service for News and Editorials for its coverage of the education reform in Mississippi. He's also served two stints in government on both sides of the aisle as a press assistant to Mississippi's Democratic Senator John Stennis and as a special assistant to Tennessee Republican Governor Lamar Alexander. He has a lifetime of accomplishments and a passion for investing and in those around him to become better leaders. Please welcome me in joining Charles Overby. Charles. It's a big introduction. Yeah, there. Really. Yeah. Big boom. <laughs> big boom right there. I love it. Charles, thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. Oh, Thank you for asking. Great. So tell us a little bit about your family, and we heard a little bit about your career, but what are some highlights for you? Well, my family, I have uh, three children. Uh, uh, married, my wife is Andrea. We've lived uh, in Nashville and in Washington most of our lives with a, a, a short stint in Cocoa Beach, Florida, where I was editor, mm -hmm. and in Jackson, Mississippi. Got a great family. Have three grandchildren. Yeah. Of ah. Ages two to eighteen. Okay. Wow. And so they keep us uh, happy and busy. I bet. I bet. Well, tell you won a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, that's amazing to me. Tell us about that. Well, that and uh, about seventy-five cents will get you on the metro bus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like to say that it's uh, being at the right place at the right time a, a lot of times. But we were involved in an investigative series and then coverage of the legislature, and then an editorial campaign to help uh, reform education in Mississippi. It was at the bottom. It's always been at the bottom. And so we tried to uh, be uh, very proactive. And they, uh, the legislature uh, did pass major sweeping education reform and gave Mississippi for the first time uh, public kindergartens. They were the last state in the country to have public kindergartens. And the Pulitzer Prize jurors decided that uh, they would award that to the Clarion Ledger. Wow, that's amazing. So, well, today we're kind of talking about politics, and uh, that's always a tough subject, right? You know, people say, you don't talk about religion and politics. So, but tell us about being in Washington, D.C., and, and uh, your time there, and just tell us a little bit about that. Well, I loved it. Uh, as a journalist, it gives you the opportunity to be on the front row seat to see things that uh, you might uh, want to see, uh, but as a journalist, you get to be right there. You know, I've had the opportunity to cover presidential campaigns, uh, flown on Air Force One, uh, been to all the political rallies. And so I've covered or uh, followed closely all the presidential campaigns since uh, Richard Nixon. Wow. And that's been a lot of fun to do. And you learn a lot about the people involved in our government. And for the most part, uh, I think uh, everybody who runs for office is really sacrificial in the sense that uh, they could do other things. They may have different motivations for why they run, but it's a hard job and it's very difficult to run for president. Yeah. It's difficult to cover the presidency. Uh, I remember on the final day of the campaign swing with Jimmy Carter, uh, we had breakfast in New York, lunch in New Orleans, and dinner in San Francisco. Now, he was making policy speeches along the way, but I remember the meals. 
And uh, so that, that's the, kind of the fun part of being a journalist. Wow. Well, out of all the things you've done, what do you feel like your greatest accomplishment is? Well, that's hard to say because, first of all, you're having to buy into the concept except that there was a great accomplishment. <laughs> and so I wouldn't presume that. I would say that uh, two things, uh, probably in my obit, they will mention that uh, I was editor of the paper that won the Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that's a great accomplishment, but that's probably what will be said. I think the thing that I got the most satisfaction out of was being able to secure the land on Pennsylvania Avenue to build this $400 million museum. And I know all of you at Rolling Hills would want to know that Larry Adama helped me build, helped build and design that amazing structure. But little do we know that that would just be kind of the uh, primer for teaching him how to build a convention center here in Nashville. <laughs> that was good preparation. Yeah, good preparation. Yeah, so it, it, it's amazing too. I've had the opportunity to go and it's unbelievable. What a, what a place. Well, it's uh, called Museum, but it's really about history seen through the lens of news people. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's amazing. Well, tell us, in all your years of covering presidential elections, I mean, have you ever seen an election like this? This is the most unbelievable election year. <laughs> I, I thought I knew and understood presidential politics and that I could stand up in front of a crowd and give historical perspective and say, this is like it was in uh, 2008, or this is similar to Teddy Roosevelt. There's nothing like this. Uh, it, it's just uh, uh, amazing. Uh, Russell Moore speaks uh, uh, for the Southern Baptist Convention on ethics and religious items, and I, he wrote something the other day that said, it's like LSD is in the water, and uh, they, every, there's a new horrifying thing every day. So uh, the people who followed it just haven't seen anything like this at all. And, and with good reason, because you have uh, the front runners uh, are, are the ones that are in the race still. Uh, Donald Trump's running like a third party candidate within the Republican party. And Bernie Sanders, uh, who was of the Socialist Party until he ran in this Democratic primary, is uh, getting uh, major support. Uh, and so it just defies what has uh, been the case in politics in past years in the primaries. Well, what makes it so different? I mean, why is it this year kind of the perfect storm, I guess, but what, what are the contributing factors to all this? Well, all the pundits say that uh, people are tired of the establishment, mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, don't think things have worked very well and they're looking for a new uh, answer, and so they want new candidates. Uh, I, I'm, I, I get a little uh, weary of people criticizing, quote, the establishment, uh, because with the establishment goes experience. I think you have to pick and choose within the establishment if you want to be critical rather than just n doing a broad brush. I don't think there's any other job in the country that you would uh, uh, elect or appoint somebody to without any experience. And so we have to make sure that uh, in our desire to throw out all the rascals that we don't bring in a completely uh, inexperienced team. Mm. Is there, I mean, you talked a little bit earlier about comparing it to previous times in history. Is there an election that kind of stands out to you where you, you think, okay, this is, there's a parallel here? The closest thing that I can recall, uh, not personally, but having read about it, was the 1912 uh, election when Teddy Roosevelt, who was a little bit like Donald Trump, very uh, uh, willing to lambast people, had a strong agenda, a forceful personality. Uh, people either loved or hated him. Uh, and he ran uh, against the person that he put in the office, uh, William Howard Taft uh, and uh, Woodrow Wilson. So it was a three-party race. And uh, so that, that was similar. The other one would be John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson, which was probably the dirtiest, most name-calling presidential election in history. And so there's some similarities to that. So uh, other than 1912 and 1828, uh, I'd say there hadn't been anything like this. Wow, you're going back 100 years. I mean, to see And anything. I remember it well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it really is. But wh why, why do you think it's all led up to this? You know, I mean, why, if it's taken 100 years, what have been the, uh, 
determining factors that have really, you know, you talked about people being frustrated with the establishment, but are there other, I mean, it, it seems like it's just so different that. Well, it is different, but it has been leading up to this. Uh, people, uh, people began to distrust government all the way back uh, the Vietnam War and with Watergate. Previously, uh, the public had pretty much thought government knows best, or they just assumed that our leaders were trying to do the right thing. And so when the Pentagon Papers came out and it showed that there was a lot of uh, deception going on about why we were fighting in Vietnam, and then when the Watergate tapes came out and Richard Nixon was shown to be a different kind of person in private than he was in public, uh, that kind of distrust uh, began. And it, it has built on uh, the case every year. Mm. What makes this election so important? I mean, you, you have a lot of people putting, I mean, probably more dollars spent already than any past election. You have uh, more uh, animosity, for lack of a better term, I mean, toward uh, candidates. What, but why is, it, why is this so important right now? Well, I have the opportunity to teach about presidential campaigns and the press at Ole Miss, where I went to school. And uh, I tell uh, my students, that every election, presidential election, is important. Mm. That each uh, election is a historical link to the past and to the future. And we're never really sure which, uh, how a presidency is going to be I involved in the historical link, but for certain, it is. Mm. And so uh, with all the problems facing us internationally and nationally uh, this year, we know that this presidential election is going to be very important. Mm. And there are some uh, major philosophical differences uh, between the candidates. That's not always the case. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, the, the country will go one way or the other depending on uh, who gets elected, mm. whether it's Supreme Court justices or health care or, or lots of issues. We, uh, the, our decision in November is going to determine where that goes. Yeah. Well, and you, uh, you spent a lot of time in D.C. You also spent a lot of time with Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and so uh, talk about the Supreme Court, because it's kind of in an upheaval right now, a lot, of, a lot of things happening there. Are there any things that you kind of see as the court continues to adjust? Well, I'm not an expert on the Supreme Court. I like the Supreme, I like uh, covering the Supreme Court. We used to hold an annual dinner for the Supreme Court justices and they and their wives and the members of the Senate and their wives would come to this dinner. And it was the uh, uh, only time there was interaction between the two branches uh, on a personal level. Uh, Robert Byrd, who had been in the Senate for 40 years, had never actually gone to the Supreme Court even though it's across the street from the Capitol, because he thought there was separation of powers and he shouldn't go. So he went to uh, one of the dinners that we had and it just changed his mind altogether. Uh, the justices are very important people, but you, you wouldn't recognize them. They, they might be out here in the audience right now and you wouldn't know who they were because they're really basically anonymous because there are no cameras in the courtroom and they like it like that. Uh, they, they prefer not to be recognized. But right now it's a 4-4 four, four philosophical uh, uh, gridlock. It's so appropriate because we have gridlock in Congress as well, so why not have gridlock at the Supreme Court? So the uh, next nominee will likely break that gridlock one way or the other, either toward a conservative bent or toward a more liberal bent. Yeah. And, um, if, if the Republicans win, probably they'll go more conservative. If the Democrats win, they'll uh, go more liberal. Mm. And so that's, uh, I can't recall a presidential election where you knew for sure that the, there would be Supreme Court nominations. Mm. Uh, there's always a general discussion about it, but we know there's a vacancy. Mm -hmm. There probably will continue to be a vacancy uh, until uh, January when the new president takes over. Wow. So a lot is riding on this election, basically. So a lot is riding. Yeah. And of course, uh, as I said, every election is important, mm -hmm. uh, but this one uh, is uh, among the most important in my lifetime. Wow. So as a Christ follower, right? I mean, we're, we're men who are following Christ, uh, first and foremost. 
How does being a Christ follower impact our view of the election and what we do with the election? This is a question that is so uh, profound. Mm -hmm. How does our Christian faith influence our political outlook? Uh, it's a question that I have dealt with and struggled with all my life mm -hmm. because uh, I've cared about politics, I've been involved in politics, uh, I've been a Christian, and I want the two to mesh. Figuring out how to make it mesh is, is uh, a difficult thing because in my judgment, after studying it for so many years, there is no, quote, Christian position on uh, the issues per se. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the uh, editor of Christianity Today wrote something recently that I thought was pretty good. He said, uh, my Christian faith informs my judgment, but it would be self-righteous to say that mine is, quote, the Christian position, and, then, and that any other is not Christian. So you get to uh, the point where you say, How do, but still you ought to have your Christian faith involved. So where I come down is that we should use our Christian faith uh, to help us look at the values of presidential candidates. And it doesn't mean that we're trying to elect as our president the person who would be the best Sunday school teacher. I elect, I, I voted uh, for a president who was the best Sunday school teacher, Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. He's still teaching Sunday school. He was an amazing man. And I was totally uh, enamored uh, with this whole idea that a Southerner, a Southern Baptist, a committed Christian could be president. And that's why I voted for him. Even though Gerald Ford had, looking back on it, had all the Christian values uh, that I would want out of a president as well. He just did not, um, express them quite as forthrightly as Jimmy Carter did. And uh, I, historians pretty much uh, agree that Jimmy Carter w was not one of our better presidents. And so, you know, maybe I didn't make the right decision there. But that has not deterred me from saying that we should view uh, at least as a major part of what we uh, do in our uh, selection process, we should view it through a Christian prism. So I, I've thought about it and said, okay, what does that mean? Uh, well, think about it in terms of where you work. You, the person you work for, you can pretty much evaluate that person in several different ways. And one of them is what is his or her value system. And you can, uh, you can take what your value system is and, and working side by side with your boss, you're gonna know uh, pretty quickly whether your value system and their value systems agree. And I, I think uh, we owe it to ourselves to do that with the presidents. Uh, I, uh, Max Licato, a, a terrific Christian writer, uh, normally does not get involved in politics at all. And he broke that silence this year to criticize Donald Trump. And I mention that not to say that Donald Trump is bad or good, except to say that Max Licato said that when a person says he's a Christian, then that person should be held to the standards of Christian values. And he took exception to uh, Donald Trump's berating people and uh, being critical of people in a way that he thinks demeans Christians. And he wrote that uh, non-Christians view Christianity through people who they know who are Christians. They don't read the Bible. They don't go to the Bible to find out about Christianity. Mm -hmm. they, they take their Christianity from the people they know. And we, we know that all of us are fallible, and so that's a burden on all of us that we face every day, mm -hmm. that if we are forthright in our Christianity, we're going to be held to a higher standard. And so... Um, most all of the candidates this time have in one degree or another professed their Christian faith. And I've seen some terrific testimonies, which I thought were sincere by several of the uh, 
presidential candidates who are no longer candidates. Mm -hmm. And they felt that uh, in America, and, and particularly in the Republican primary, that they needed to assert without equivocation uh, their Christian faith. And I don't have a problem with that. But that in and of itself will not make a good president. Um, uh, the uh, Martin Luther famously said uh, a few hundred years ago, he said, I would rather be ruled by a competent Turk than an incompetent Christian. Well, that's pretty strong. I was on the steps of the uh, Tennessee State Capitol when I was working for Lamar Alexander, and Jerry Falwell came to town, and there was a big rally. And he said, the uh, worst Christian presidential candidate is better than the best non-Christian candidate. I think you can't go that far. And, and it's important to remember that we are not a theocracy. Uh, we are a democratic government. And we want Christian values in our government and in our leaders, but we are not electing a preacher or a Sunday school teacher. We're electing somebody to run our country. And so that's where the tension comes in, mm -hmm. of trying to figure out who the best person is to lead, but also who, someone whose values that we can uh, appreciate and support. It's kind of a long answer, but it's, uh, I hope it helps uh, it's because it's not a simple answer. Right. No, I mean, I think, wow, you made a lot of good points there. I mean, especially when you talked about people see Christianity through the eyes of Christians, you know, not the Bible. I mean, we're the only Jesus some people may ever see. So uh, how we lead at our work, how we lead in, in places, but uh, also how we follow. And I think that's important. Um, and, and I think this is, you're, you're hitting on the crux of it because it is such a challenging, I, I remember growing up and uh, I grew up in a big church and I remember finding out that our pastor was a Democrat and he was a big Democrat, you know, and my, my parents were Republicans. And, and I remember being in, in high school and finding this revelation out and going, well, wait a minute, you know, I didn't know that Democrats could be Christians, you know, because <laughs> that's what I didn't hear that. At. And then, you know, my, I talked to my pastor and he'd go, well, I didn't know Republicans could be Christians, you know, what are you about the poor? And you know, so, so I realized, wait a minute, there's both sides of the aisle here. And uh, it really is. And you know, Jeff, it trivializes Christianity so much to compartmentalize it into one of two America's political parties. Mm -hmm. Christianity is so much bigger than bigger. that. Yeah. And for us to uh, act like Christianity is on uh, either Republican or Democrat is saying that we, we are making Christianity too small, mm -hmm. that our faith and uh, our values are much larger than any political party. That is a great point. Because it's like we're trying to take Christianity and roll it up under the Republican agenda or the Democratic agenda versus, hey, wait a minute, we're, we're a Christ follower, right? And then you can roll up under this, but Christ is bigger than, than all of us. Exactly right. yeah. yeah. So how do we talk to people who we may disagree with? You know, I mean, how do we have some uh, being civil to one another? It seems like that's kind of a lost art in our uh, country. But even as Christ followers, when we have people at work or, or wherever, how do we how do we talk to people that we disagree with in politics? Well, that's a great question and an, and an important one. Uh, we have the center at Ole Miss, the Center for Southern Journalism and Politics, and one of the goals is to engage in civil discourse mm. about politics. And we we have lost that uh, ability to do that, and our candidates in particular have lost that ability. It seems like whoever can deliver the most zinging insult gets the <laughs> press for the day. And uh, so I, I think that the way to do it is to not try to push your political uh, view on people. I think it's just fine to say, I am for X because of such and such, but not try to say, and unless you agree with me, you're dumb, uh, uh, heathen, yeah. and uh, don't know anything about the future of our country. Uh, I think that political discussions in the Christian context offers uh, an opportunity for humility. Mm -hmm. That uh, we come across so often as the opposite of humility by trying to say, well, this person is a real Christian, 
and uh, I wouldn't even think about voting uh, for that uh, person. And you come and you come across as uh, a person who's uh, not very uh, attractive to mm-hmm. others. So I, th- I think our Christian witness is a lot more important than our political witness. Mm-hmm. And so many, uh, uh, quite a few uh, religious leaders now are opting not to uh, be public in their political views because they've come to the conclusion that their ministries are hurt by being identified too closely with one candidate or one party uh, or the other. Mm. And, and so I think um, it's great to say what you think. And I tell you, it's, it's a uh, sport of mine to talk politics at dinner. And I don't expect my friends to agree with me all the time or disagree, but I try to, even when we disagree, we try to do it in an agreeable way. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the key is to respect other people's opinions. Don't uh, insinuate yourself as uh, knowing more than anybody else, but you can offer some uh, reasoned uh, factors in why you might be for somebody without trying to make it sound like you know everything. Man, that's good. I mean, the person you're talking to is more important than you winning the argument, right? Exactly right. You know, and uh, that, that's, that's so helpful. What about a lot of us here are, are dads? Um, and it seems like, you know, wow, the presidential coverage is nonstop. I mean, it's on every, you know, uh, social medium you can, you can imagine. So our kids are exposed to this. How do we, as fathers, talk to our kids about politics? Well, I think it is important to talk about politics to your family and your children and your grandchildren. I have an 18-year-old granddaughter who's voting for the first time this year. And so she told me who she's for who is not who I'm for. And uh, so rather than shut her down, I uh, congratulated her on being involved in uh, having a candidate. And and I began to engage her in a discussion about why she supported uh, that candidate. And uh, I didn't, when she told me what her answers were, I didn't say, oh, well, that's stupid. Or I don't, I don't agree with that at all. I said, well, I'm just glad you're involved and I hope you'll keep studying the issues so that you can uh, really make uh, good informed judgments. And she came back to me recently and said, you know, I'm kind of rethinking my position on this particular candidate. And, and so I think as children hear their parents talk about politics, uh, just as they hear them talk about uh, their Christian faith, it becomes a natural thing for them. So I think it's a very healthy thing to have open discussion. Yeah. They say, don't talk about religion or politics in, in large gatherings uh, or family gathering, uh, large family gathering. But if you do it in the right way, uh, I think it's a positive thing. So I would encourage fathers to, uh, to engage their family in political discussion. That's great. Well, and we have a biblical mandate to pray for our leaders, right? And so I think even helping our kids or families being able to pray for the leaders who are in office right now or for future leaders, I think is important too. And just to say, hey, they're leading our country. We, we want them to succeed, right? Because right. that impacts our lives. So. Well, that's important. I'm in a Monday morning Bible study, and we always pray for our leaders in our country. But you look at it, even uh, in the Old Testament days, you know, the, the three uh, great kings we hear about, Saul, David, Solomon, they, they, uh, they had their problems. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and even when, uh, you know, people always want a king. Back then they wanted a king. And so God gave them a king, gave them Saul. And Saul messed up. And, you know, everybody messes up. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's something we just have to uh, continually recognize that no president is going to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you say to people who are overly stressed or totally consumed with uh, the election and who the next president's gonna be? Like, I mean, I'm packing up, I'm moving to Canada, right? I mean, who, if this person's elected, what, what do you say to that? Remember the NFL quarterback last year, uh, for the, well, I think Aaron Rodgers, who said R-E-L-A-X, when the Packers weren't doing so well at the beginning. I would tell that to people, you know? Uh, The country is going to move on, but God is in charge. Mm. And God's kingdom is bigger and more important than the United States government. Uh, It always will be, it always has been. And if we spent half the time 
talking about our Christian faith that we do talking about politics or worrying about politics. Uh, our families, our community, our state would be much better off. I recognize, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I talk about it nonstop. But it's just, it's going to be okay mm -hmm. because we know what the bigger uh, eternal picture is. So don't get stressed about it. Don't move to Canada. Uh, you know, their leader's not any better than Canada. I might move to Costa Rica. It's warm down there. But, uh, uh, but no, I think you can overstress. And, uh, and that's another thing in talking with your family is because you can build this up into such a big thing. And then the day after the election, you know, your children, when you see your candidate didn't win, your children can say, oh no, we are, what's going to happen to our country? We'll, we'll be okay. And even if the country isn't okay, uh, we, know, we know where our priorities mm -hmm. are as Christians. Right. And we just have to do better four years later. Wow. I, that is so good. I mean, our God is sovereign, right? He's over everything. And to think about that, that he's in control ultimately. Mm -hmm. And to have faith, right? And not fear. And so many times I think we're driven by fear. And uh, man, it's so good. Charles, you've done so much, um, but what do you want your legacy to be? Well, there again, once you start saying that you have a legacy, you're kind of being uh, uh, puffed up with self-importance. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess I would want it to be said that I cared about people. Mm. Uh, and uh, if that is said after I'm dead and gone, then I, I'll be happy. Wow, I love that. Well, give us two takeaways as you think about the presidential election and uh, all the politics that, that are going on. Give us two takeaways for us as we enter in this season. Well, one we just talked about is that uh, life will go on after the election and that our Christian faith should not be deterred in one way by whoever is elected president. And, and the second is that uh, this gives us an opportunity to share our faith without trying to uh, get it wrapped into partisanship. And that in many ways we could almost say, uh, well, the, the real leader in my life is Christ. Mm. Uh, and so I, I keep our eye on the ball uh, might be the more important uh, takeaway than getting too consumed with uh, any one candidate. Wow. This is good. This is really good. So I know we've got some questions. You want to? Yeah, we do. Let's jump in. Um, question number one, what are your thoughts on the efforts that were made to make the Bible the state's official book? I thought Governor Haslam said it just right, that it trivialized uh, the Bible. Uh, I understand there were well-meaning people that put that forward, but we, we are not in a theocracy. Uh, uh, the Bible, I'm sure, is the most important book in everybody's life here. But does that mean it needs to be the official book of Tennessee? Uh, uh, because we're in a diverse society, I tend to look at all those laws by substituting uh, some other non-Christian thing to see if I would think that would be our. I wouldn't want the Koran to be the official book. And I don't think the Muslims want the Bible to be the official book. That doesn't mean it's any less important, but uh, it just trivializes. It puts it on the level with having the state flower or the state tree. And so I, uh, you know, I'm, I like magnolia trees. I think magnolia tree ought to be the official tree of every state. Uh, but uh, but I, I just think the governor hit it just right there. Yeah, that's good. Good question. Okay, we got another one here. Is there a leadership lesson from your early years as a reporter in Jackson that has stuck with you through the years, and how have you seen it play out in your career? That's a really good question, uh, and just off the top of my head, I would say that uh, the main thing that I got out of being a reporter that's helped me as a leader, to the extent that I'm a leader, is uh, to learning how to ask the right question, and then more importantly, learning how to listen to the answer. Uh, People, uh, you don't have all the knowledge yourself, and the only way you're going to get it is to ask smart people questions. And uh, uh, so as a reporter, I learned how to ask questions. But so many people, uh, even when they ask questions, they fail to hear it. They're always thinking about what's, what's the next thing. You hate to be with somebody, and you're talking to them, and you know they're uh, either trying to think of what they're going to say 
next, or they're looking over your shoulder. Uh, the art of listening and the art of uh, questioning uh, are the two best things I got out of being a reporter. I think that is huge, and especially in our society today, this whole idea of being present, you know, being present with your spouse. Um, you know, we, I mean, it's like people lay in bed and they're on their iPads or their phones the whole time, you know, or, or being present with our kids. Mm -hmm. uh, but being around people who can make you better, but being present, being engaged and listening and, and learning. And I heard a great thing uh, on a, I, I walk about five, six miles most days, and I have these podcasts I listen to. And I, there was a, a biography of somebody, and uh, his mother would ask him when he came home from school every day, not what did you learn today, but did you ask a good question today? And I thought, that's pretty good. Wow. That is good. Mm -hmm. That is good. So we're always learning, right? It doesn't stop. You don't get to a point and you think you know it all. I mean, you're, yeah, you're and that's learning. the danger as you get older is you begin to think you do know it. And so <laughs> I, I used to ask a lot more questions than I do now, and I think that I have to remind myself that I am no smarter today than I was 30 years ago. Mm. Well, I do want to commit you. Do we have one more? Or? Okay. Do one more, and then I'll okay. commit you. Um, I don't know if we'll have the text for this one. This just came in. Have you ever experienced a moment in your career where you had to choose between wearing the unbiased reporter hat and the devoted Christian hat, and how did you respond? Uh, yes. Um, you know, when you're a reporter, you're kind of in the uh, in a den of lines, and uh, if if you keep your faith a secret, it's pretty easy just to kind of roll along. But if people know uh, that you're a Christian, they look, they test you, they look to see if you're going to go along with the crowd. And so uh, we don't have the time to get into two or three stories that could, uh, would be defining for me, but I, I would say that uh, your colleagues, particularly non-believing colleagues, uh, watch you every day to see if you're going to be like all the other people or, uh, and a hypocrite uh, or whether you're going to be true to your faith. And that's, that's the test. And I think we have to pray for the strength to live our Christian faith uh, every day, every hour. It's hard, it's hard if, particularly if you're outside a monastery, if you're out in the world. Uh, you know, they say be in the world but not of it. That's a lot easier to write than it is to do. Mm. It's so easy. To, I, I, I want you to know I'm the best Christian I'll be all day right here today mm -hmm. among all you good Christians. Mm -hmm. And that's strong, though. I mean, you, people are always watching. You know, mm -hmm. and we don't think about that, and, mm -hmm. but they are. And, and, yeah, like we said, I mean, we're the only Bible some may ever read. You know, okay. we're the only Jesus some may ever see. So, yeah, how do we live that? Uh, Charles, I do want to commend you. I mean, you have the overbe. Uh, School of Journalism now at, at Ole Miss, and, and like you said, you're still alive, which most buildings at universities are all dead, so that's good. And, but you go back there to teach, mm -hmm. and you're pouring into the next generation, and, and I love that. You could have easily just said, hey, I'm going to retire and, you know, kick back and move to Cocoa Beach, Florida, wherever, but you are still investing in raising up and making this country better. And I want to say thank you, you well, know, well, for the thank difference you, you make. Thank and, you, Jeff. If I, if I was as good a golfer as you are, I'd probably just play golf. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Since I'm not a very good yeah, golfer, I yeah. need to keep doing something. Well, I've got a long way to go. So. <laughs> but I do thank you, too, just for the difference you've made in my life and the difference you've made here at Rolling Hills. I mean, you, have from the beginning, have been always so supportive and prayerful and encouraging and been a mentor to me and, and I'm just uh, thank you thank you, so, thank you yeah. Jeff. thanks for all that so, you do well, let's pray together you guys father thank you for the day God and thank you for Charles thank you for God just speaking through him this morning and challenging me and father when it comes to politics uh, God it's 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 difficult for us as Christ followers God we want to put you first we want to um, be able to pray for our leaders we want to be able to impact our country um, and God, we pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us discernment. We pray, Father, um, for every one of us, God, as we walk through life, that we would be godly husbands and fathers, that we'd be men after your heart, uh, that we would be leaders in our community. And Father, we don't have all the right answers, but God, we know you are with us and you are for us. And God, if you're with us and for us, then who can stand against us? And so, Father, we trust you. God, we do pray for all the candidates out there today, and we pray, Father, that you would give them strength, and we pray for our country. And God, to you be glory forever and ever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Great. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for doing that. Um, It's been really good. Uh, Be on the lookout for your Men's Leadership Network Rewind. It's the email that comes out later this afternoon. It'll have uh, the replay of this this morning's uh, conversation, as well as some links to some helpful resources. Uh, Next week, you don't want to miss. Mike Hamilton's going to be here. Many of you know Mike as the former athletic director of the University of Tennessee. He is currently the executive director of Show Hope. Uh, We're going to be discussing the importance of being vulnerable in our leadership position. So we'll have breakfast at 6.30. We'll get kicked off at 7 o'clock. Please join us. Thanks.